Welcome back. In the last session, we looked at the narrative of the call of Levi or Matthew and Jesus' sayings on the harvest. After that, we turn to the second great discourse of the Gospel of Matthew, the Discipleship Discourse, where we examine the mission of the Twelve, the results of that mission, and the rewards of discipleship. In the current session, we turn to the 11th chapter of Matthew's Gospel to examine the narrative of Jesus and the disciples sent by John the Baptist and Jesus' estimation of John. Then Jesus turns his attention to the current generation and his appraisal of it. Finally, we look at a rather interesting section of Matthew, which really seems like it should be a part of the Gospel of John. For that reason, it has come to be called by scholars the Johannine Thunderbolt in the Matthean sky. The opening verse of chapter 11 in Matthew forms the transition from the disciple discourse to the section on the messengers from John the Baptist. Using his standard conclusion formula, when Jesus had finished giving these commands, or all these sayings and other discourses, Matthew then notes that Jesus continues his teaching and preaching ministry. It is in the course of that teaching and preaching that the messengers of John the Baptist approach him. Since this text has a parallel in Luke 7, 18-23, it's generally accepted that this text is a text that will be found in the document Q. Q, you will recall, is a hypothetical text reconstructed generally by German scholars to explain the common material between the, Matthew, the, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. John has been imprisoned by Herod Antipas as recorded at Matthew 4.12. The historian Josephus tells us that John was held at the fortress of Makaros, east of the Jordan River. This is found in Josephus' Antiquities, Book 18, Chapter 5, Section 2. It was here that most feel that John met his end by beheading, as we shall see later in Matthew's text. From his prison cell, John has heard of the wondrous works of Jesus, and he sends a number of his disciples to investigate. They bring Jesus the question which is pressing on John's mind. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we search for another? From his preaching recorded in chapter 3, John was clearly expecting the end of the age. Was Jesus the one who would announce and usher in that end of the age? The coming judgment that John had spoken about was not seemingly being accomplished. John himself, in fact, was languishing in prison. Was the final age beginning, or wasn't it? Jesus' response is that they return and tell him what they are witnessing that is, the works of the Messiah. What Jesus has been saying, chapters 5 through 7 and chapter 10, the discourses, and what he's been doing, chapters 8 through 9. Then those works of the Messiah are spelled out in a clear manner, using the language of the Old Testament, particularly Isaiah 35, for the Messianic age. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Jesus does what the coming one is expected to do. And therefore, the answer to John's disciples' question is that he is the coming one. The answer then concludes with a beatitude, which lets John, the hearers, 
And the readers of the gospel know that, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not the Messiah awaited by John. Some will find the Messiahship of Jesus a stumbling block, a source of offense. This is designated through the use of the verb skandalizo, which means to cause offense or be a stumbling block. Hence, those who put their faith in Jesus as the coming one are not being offended, but rather are, are declared blessed. John and us are being challenged to let go of our preconceived notions of the messianic age and put trust in Jesus as the coming one and in his messiahship. For John, that will mean remaining in prison and ultimately facing a martyr's death. Hagner, in his commentary, brings out the fact that John must accept this. He was correct in seeing Jesus as the promised one. But also he must realize that the kingdom that Jesus brings does not entail judgment on the wicked. Rather, the message of the kingdom goes to the unrighteous to lead them to change their ways and walk in the right relationship with God. Jesus calls the unrighteous not to punishment, but rather to conversion. Having received their answer from Jesus, John's disciples depart and return to John. This gives Jesus an opportunity to address the crowds who have been following and listening to the exchange between John's disciples and Jesus to hear Jesus' estimation of John. Three times he asks them a simple question. When they went out into the desert, what did they go out to see? Remember, the wilderness was the place where John ministered. The wilderness connotes a place of revelation and messianic salvation in the words of Hagner. Then Jesus presents an answer to his question in the form of another question. Did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind? Reeds were common along the shores of the, of the Jordan River. There were tall grass that grew along the river, which were light enough to sway this way and that in the wind. Thus, Jesus' metaphor may imply weakness or vacillation. Now, from what we have seen of John, these are not at all characteristic of him. If anything, John appears to be unbendable. So, Jesus presents a contrast of the shaking reed to the unbendable John. So clearly, that's not what people went out to see when they approached John in the desert. So Jesus poses a second possible answer to his question. Did you go out to see a man clothed in fine apparel? That certainly is not John either. He's described as being arrayed in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, the garb of Elijah. Then Jesus comments on this second metaphor. Those in fine clothing are in palaces, not in the desert. So again, that's not what they went out to see when they went to the desert. Finally, he asks the third question. Did you go out to see a prophet? This is the answer that he's looking for. They went out to see a prophet and not a king. Yes, I tell you. Signified by the particle nigh, meaning yes, implying that this is the answer. And he continues, and more than a prophet. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? He's not only a prophet, but he's the one designated to prepare the way for the Messiah, spoken of in the prophecy of Malachi. He's Elijah returned to life, the precursor of the Messiah. Matthew then cites Exodus 23.20, 20, 
in combination with Ma- with Malachi thir- three one. Let's take a moment and compare the original Malachi text with the citation of Matthew. The material cited exactly is in red. Where Malachi has an infinitive to prepare, Matthew uses a relative clause who shall prepare. Matthew adds the prepositional phrase before thy face. And most importantly, Matthew changes the person of the pronouns from the first person in Malachi to the second person in Matthew. Malachi speaks of the preparation of the way of the Lord, who is the speaker. Matthew speaks of John as preparing the way of Christ, who is spoken to. Finally, Matthew uses only the first part of the verse, leaving out the references to the temple and the covenant. So, through the citation of Malachi, Matthew identifies John the Baptist as Elijah, who will prepare the Messiah's way in the next verse. For Matthew, John the Baptist stands between the old and the new orders. John marks the close of the old order and is a precursor of the new. Thus, he can can be said to be a transition figure between them. He's a prophet, like those of the past, but in him, Old Testament expectations point to the coming of the Messiah. This will be made even clearer in the next verse. Jesus then gives the greatest estimation of John. He begins it with the solemn formula, Amen, I say to you. Among those born of woman, no one is greater than John. John supersedes all who were pre- preceded him because he announced the coming one. But in all that, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. To see the full import of this comparison, it's critical that one understand that it's not John and others that are being compared. Rather, it is the comparison between the Old Testament period and the kingdom. And clearly, the present fulfillment of the kingdom overshadows the era of promise in the Old Testament. It's important to note that John is not excluded from the kingdom. Elsewhere, Jesus has stated that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are part of the kingdom. So also, then, will John be a part of the kingdom. A rather difficult text of Matthew follows. From the days of John, John the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, biadzatai. This has been interpreted in various ways through the ages. The interpretation hinges on the translation of the verb biadzo, which means suffer violence. Thus, the most logical meaning would be that those who have embraced the kingdom invariably have suffered violence. That would be in line with the eighth beatitude and the added beatitude that we saw in our discussion of chapter 5 in the beatitudes. The suffering for the kingdom has been since the days of John. John is in prison because of his convictions concerning the kingdom and Herod's illicit marriage to his brother's wife. This is the meaning of Matthew 17.12. Elijah has already come, Matthew says, and they did not know him, but they did to him whatever they wished. We've seen that Elijah figure in Matthew's gospel. And he is John the Baptist. The saying continues, And men of violence take it by force. Violence here is biastai, a correlative of biadzomai, and take it by force, harpadzusin. Hegner interprets this for us, for all its greatness, the kingdom suffers violence 
and men plunder it. Jesus then presents the climax of his estimation of John. All the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Through the use of the adjective all, pantes, Matthew shows that the entirety of prophetic activity and expectation concerning the future culminates in John. As a result, John is a part of the old and a part of the new. He is, as we have said, a transition. Thus, for Matthew, the law and the prophets bear a united witness to Jesus. John, in his role as forerunner or precursor to the Messiah, becomes then the transition to this new era or this new age. What Matthew, following Mark, implied through the citation of Malachi 3.1 above is now made explicit. He is Elijah who is to come if you are willing to accept it. John is not Elijah returned to earth from heaven. Rather, John functions in the function of Elijah in the period just preceding the end time. As we have implied above, it was generally thought that Elijah would return just prior to the Messiah to prepare his way. It's this belief that grounds Matthew's portrait of John the Baptist as Elijah. Yet looking at it, many found it difficult to accept John languishing in prison about to die as Elijah. In just the same manner, many would see it difficult to see Jesus dying ignominiously on the cross as the Messiah and Son of God. Thus, John prefaces his identification with the condition, a thelata dexasthai, if you're willing to accept it. In other words, to understand this, faith is necessary. The final exhortation, which is common in gospel literature, is a call to that faith. The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. Ha ekon ota okuato. Let the one with ears of faith pay attention to what's being said. This phrase has been used in Matthew following texts with difficult content. So, as we noted above, how can John be the precursor? The Elijah character of the Messiah if he now sits in the prison of Herod? The answer is that John can only be seen in relationship to Jesus. If Jesus is the Messiah, the coming one, the expected one, then John is the last of the prophets and the first of the kingdom. That relation between John and Jesus will carry through the gospel. What will happen to John in a few chapters? will be a foreshadowing of what will happen to Jesus. From John the Baptist, Jesus turns now to a discussion of the present generation. Those who are offered the possibility of faith in Jesus, and some accept and some don't. Harrington notes that the section following on the preceding attempts to shift the blame for an inappropriate behavior of John and Jesus described above to the genuinely inappropriate response of their opponents, the present generation. Seemingly in frustration, Jesus begins, To what shall I compare this generation? Tain gena'an tautain. The word gena'an, or generation, has a negative sense to it. It speaks of opponents, those who do not believe in Jesus or in John. The answer to the query 
is that they're like children sitting in the marketplaces. They're like childish brats who taunt but will not participate in games. There is an energetic group who chide another somewhat lethargic group about joining in the games that they're playing. We piped for you, but you did not dance. This seemingly refers to what is called the wedding game. We wailed for you, and you did not mourn. This is the funeral game. Make-believe games the children played. Then Jesus applies this metaphor of children playing or refusing to play to the situation of Jesus and John the Baptist. John came, neither eating nor drinking, a rather ascetic lifestyle, and they immediately presume that he is possessed by a demon. This allowed them to refuse to listen to John and do as they would. They faulted him for his asceticism. This would be akin to the funeral game. Then the wedding game. The Son of Man. Remember, this is a favorite title of Jesus for himself, and thus Jesus came eating and drinking. Now we have the opposite, and the people dismiss him, saying, Behold, a glutton and a drunkard. So those who refused to listen to Jesus faulted him for his attendance at banquets. So one could say, with this generation, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. They have an answer for everything. Further, Jesus has proven himself to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Then the conclusion. Wisdom is justified by her deeds. Edikaiothe he Sophia apoton ergon autes in Greek. In many places in the gospel, Jesus is identified with personified wisdom. Thus, as wisdom does what is right and will, it will be vindicated by her deeds, as shown in the wisdom literature, so too will Jesus be vindicated by his deeds. Foremost among those deeds are the ones that John's disciples had been told to report back to John, as we saw earlier in this session. Thus, Jesus, as recorded in Matthew, is saying that you will know who's right and who's not by their fruits, Jesus, John, or this generation. Then Jesus critiques many of the town where his mighty deeds have been performed and yet remained unbelieving. Some scholars see this as an oracle of judgment. Then a surprising shift in gears takes place. Jesus moves from rebuke and reproach to thanksgiving and prayer. The language, as I mentioned above, seems much more like it should be out of the Gospel of John than Matthew. And so this section has become known as the Johannine Thunderbolt in the Mathean sky. Matthew links this to the preceding with the simple phrase, at that time. The use of the participle answering may imply that this is Jesus' response to the unbelief described in the preceding. Jesus then begins, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. This is very similar to the opening of the Lord's Prayer. The verb used is ex homologeo, which has the sense of give thanks, praise, or confess. It's found in many of the Thanksgiving Psalms. It's used as an introduction to the recital of what God has done, and is thus a public proclamation of praise for what God has done. Further, the address Lord of Heaven and Earth shows that God's sovereignty above and below is indicated but it also combines the sovereignty with the intimacy of the address Father, Abba. 
This prepares for the special relationship of Jesus as Son to God as Father that will be set forth soon. The content of the thanksgiving is then stated, introduced by the particle haughty. Jesus is thankful that the Father has hidden the significance of Jesus and John's deeds from the wise and the understanding, while at the same time revealing it to the merest of children. Hagner points out that this is perfectly normal, since the wise, for the most part, tend to become proud and self-sufficient in their wisdom and unreceptive regarding the new and the unexpected. This could very well be a large number of scribes and Pharisees. On the other hand, the Father has revealed that significance to little children. The childlike are unselfconscious, de dependent, and receptive. The poor and the oppressed are included here. Then, beginning with that particle nigh, yes, that we saw above, and the address to the Father repeated, Jesus shows that all occurs in the realm of God's gracious will, guiding and directing all. For thus your good pleasure was before you. The keeping hitting, hidden and the revealing are all part of God's plan. Nothing happens outside of God's will. All this leads to the conclusion that the Father's sovereign purpose, spoken of at the beginning of this section, is worked out in the acceptance or rejection of the message of Jesus, articulated in the preceding part of chapter 11. The focus now shifts from the Father to the Son. Some see this relationship of father-son as similar to the Gospel of John, but also they see it as a key to understanding Matthew's understanding of Jesus, what's known as his Christology. Jesus continues, All things have been handed over, paradidomi, to me by my Father. Jesus, the Son, is agent of the Father, and thus the Father has granted to the Son his agent, what's necessary to fulfill his mission. Jesus continues, No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. There is a mutual knowledge between the Father and the Son. Thus the Son becomes the means whereby others can come to know the Father. As Turner points out, only through the Son can humans receive knowledge of the Father. This is further emphasized in the final part of the statement, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him, apocalypsi. That's a word used for an uncovering, and it will become significant in the book of Revelation. Having shown the exalted relationship of the Father and the Son, and the Son's role in mediating knowledge to the, of the Father, Jesus now makes an invitation. Come to me, all you. This is very similar to the invitation addressed to the Apostles in the call narrative we saw at the beginning of the Gospel. Duta opiso mu, he says, come after me. Here, it's direct, come but the same verb, duta, and it's addressed to all, all who labor and who are burdened or, are, or, or, or who are heavy laden. Those who are tired and burdened can come to Jesus and be his disciples, and through that discipleship come to know him, and through him come to know the Father, a knowledge that will ease their burden and refresh their tiredness. The burdened could well be those who are caught up in obeying the law and being righteous. That is, those who are bogged down following the minutiae of the developing legal codes of the Pharisees. We'll hear about these later when we get to Matthew 23. 
when these come to Jesus, he will give them rest. The verb on apauso has the connotation of give rest, quiet, or refreshment. Discipleship to Jesus will give refreshment from the burdens of everyday life. This is a message that we many times overlook. When we feel overwhelmed, simply turn to the Lord and let the Lord refresh us. What a wonderful thought. The same is now stated in different terms. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The yoke image is that of an animal harnessed to work. The yoke provides discipline and direction. Judaism used the image of a yoke to describe the law. In particular, Sirach 51.26 speaks of a student putting their neck under the yoke and letting the souls receive instruction. Taking the yoke is paralleled with instruction. And so Jesus continues, learn from me. The reason for, Jesus, for taking Jesus' yoke and learning from him is specified in yet another clause. For I am meek and humble of heart. The word for meek we saw in the Beatitudes refers to the yoke or bit in the mouth of a horse's bridle, whereby the horse is guided by the rider. It's the virtue of allowing another to guide you. As we take the yoke of Jesus upon us, we allow ourselves to be guided by the Father. And in that guidance, we will find rest and refreshment from the burdens of this life for our souls. This is another way of saying what Augustine summed up eloquently when he said, Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Notice, that both parts of this exhortation end in the notion of rest or refreshment. Then comes the conclusion of the exhortation. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're faced with a choice. Those who follow the way of the Pharisees will of necessity toil and be heavy burdened. Those who follow the way of Jesus, by contrast, will take upon themselves a kind yoke and a light burden. So, which will it be? Well, that's about all we have time for. Next time, we'll look at the difficult text concerning the sin against the Holy Spirit then Jesus' definition of true kindred. And we'll continue with the third of the five discourses in Matthew, the parables discourse. See you then.